John Sounds. I, I uh, was asked to come here by Charlie Mouton. He's my cousin. And uh, I grew up here in Houston, went to Episcopal High School. So I'm very familiar with you guys here. Uh, didn't do much engineering in high school, but got into a uh, mechanical engineering program at the University of Houston. So stuck around town, but uh, was always really passionate about math and science and decided to go into something applying it a little bit. So uh, pursued a mechanical engineering degree there. And then uh, I was fortunate enough that right out of college, I got hired with uh, SKF. They were recruiting down here in Houston to fill one of their satellite offices. And then for the past, for the first year and a half, I was with the company. I was actually at our corporate offices in Nansale, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philly. And they gave me a thorough rundown of the company, sent me out to all the manufacturing here in the US, all the satellite offices in the US to meet everybody, see what we do, and learn a little bit more about bearings than the one day I got in college. And so now I can speak confidently about it to all of you here. Um, a little bit about SKF. We are uh, we are one of the world's oldest bearing manufacturing companies. Uh, I'll get in a little bit more detail what a bearing actually is. Some of you might be familiar with that. Um, we were founded over 100 years ago, and uh, in Sweden. Hi to on. you. Is the teacher in here, right here? ourselves as more than just a bearing company. We're the, we, we like to say that we're the knowledge engineering company and uh, to that end we try to advance technology as much as we can and right now our goal is to have a new patent application submitted every single day. I think we're close to that uh, here in the U.S. Globally I think we might be up to two a day but um, it, it's mostly focused at at our design centers in uh, Sweden and the Netherlands, and then here in the US as well. Uh, some of the locations of our uh, manufacturing and offices around the US, it's clustered up near Pennsylvania mostly, but we do have, uh, do have some going further, further south, and of course the office here in the and there's some in California. Now we're more than just a bearing company. We we are traditionally known for bearings and housings or unit unit systems where the bearings are integrated and you can just bolt it down and go. Uh, but we do manufacture and design supporting equipment as well. So seals, lubrication systems. We actually recently acquired one of the uh, largest lubrication systems companies in the U.S. Uh, just two years ago now for. Acquisition. Um, mechatronics, I'll get into that a little bit. It's the combination of mechanical systems and electronic systems, um, more focusing on actuators or sensorized bearing units and things like that. And then services platform, which in, in encapsulates training as well as condition monitoring systems and just uh, general diagnostic services as well. A little bit on pictures of uh, bearings and units. Uh, the one in the middle bottom is a hub unit, and I believe that one is sensorized as well. And that would be like uh, your what 
you would bolt your wheel to on your car. That's the bearings that help it rotate. Uh, some more different styles of bearings, just a sort of I'll get into a little bit what the purpose is. Uh, seals, uh, not just rotary seals, but pressure seals as well. or a centralized pumping system uh, going to multiple points on a larger machine. And mechatronics, which we uh, pump our linear guides in as well uh, with our actuator systems. And it's your uh, magnetic bearings, which is a very interesting product that I know not enough about. <laughs> essentially a, a, a bearing uh, with no rolling elements. It, it, it floats on magnets. So that's a, a true no friction bearing. Um, and services. Uh, one, of, one of the things I left out of the services discussion was also advanced modeling and visual simulation. Um, we can actually do finite element analysis on on housings and, uh, asso and uh, associated structures to see how they flex <coughs> under load and then how, how those deflections are actually impacting the applied load to the bearings. So we, we can get into some really advanced uh, modeling techniques as well. Um, this, I thought, was, when I first saw the, these sets of slides, it, it, it really opened up for me, at least, what a bearing was it makes a lot more sense. If you've ever tried pushing a book across a table with a ruler, or with your hand for that matter, you, you're getting some resistance. With a real big, heavy textbook, you're not going to be able to really push it because the friction between the, the uh, book and the table surface is too high. So if, if you put some pencils or some of these markers under it, it rolls a lot smoother, and that's basically the whole basis for uh, why you would need a bearing. If you want something to roll with less friction, to roll a lot faster, with a lot less input torque, in this case, required to start the motion. Now, if we, if we add more rolling elements, uh, more pencils, it, it makes it a little bit easier. Now, a bearing is just if you were to fold up that book, that becomes the inner ring of a bearing. The pencils are the rolling elements or balls. And if you were to fold that table up around it, it would be the outer ring. And this is a little bit different style bearing that I'll go into in a minute, but um, just to pass something around so you guys can see what a bearing is. <laughs> This bearing is special because it's the uh, design of bearing that our company was founded on. It's a self-aligning ball bearing, meaning that uh, the, the inner ring and rolling elements can actually displace uh, from the outer ring to accommodate uh, a shaft that might be tilted or flexing under load. Um, traditional bearing would bind up in that situation applied loads would essentially skyrocket, and high load really takes away from your life, and so you get failures a lot quicker in a case like that. Um, I, know, I understand I'm jumping around a little bit, and feel free if you have any questions to, to stop me or, or you know, raise, raise your hand or whatever. It's, it's, it's really open. Um, so the, the functions of a bearing main purpose is to hold up a shaft of some kind or a housing of some kind if you're, if you're working with a pulley system. And uh, really the main goal always is to reduce friction because if, if we weren't worried about friction, you could just have two pieces of metal up against each other rubbing and uh, we do still use that in some cases, like in door hinges. Those are bearings. They don't have rolling elements in them friction isn't really that important. It's still low enough that you can 
open the door. But um, but sometimes it, it, it gets a little harder if they get rusted out. They, they bind up a lot easier. Um, so in, in most industries, the main goal is to reduce friction. Lower friction means lower energy that you have to input into the system means you're running a more efficient system. Uh, they also transfer the loads. It, you know, if, you, if you have the, some weight on the shaft or um, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to see if you in, in conveyor type systems like you using some of your robots, a load or a ball rolling across, coming across the roller, that's going to be added weight. That's going to be a load on the bearings. Uh, you know, it, it, it's to help transmit that into the more rigid supporting structure of your housing or, um, yeah, I guess houses and things like that. You probably should have had this a little bit earlier, but I didn't. Precision products. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with bearings in, in any other, uh, just in general, I guess. I don't know if you guys are very familiar with bearings, but uh, one of the common places 
at least I first saw bearings was in skateboards. Skateboards, rollerblades, that kind of thing. And um, in skateboards, you see a lot of different precision class bearings because they, they're trying to tell how much better they are, how how uh, how much faster you can go on them. And so it, we get into uh, here in the U.S. the ABEC grades, and as the number goes up, you're getting higher and higher precision. But uh, if we go back here. Uh, all of these are, are already incredibly high precision, even standard bearings. Uh, if you see the, the amount of deviation allowed is 0 to 15 microns, and a micron uh, with relation to a human hair is about that big. So, you know, we're, it, you're not even talking about a, a, a variation in in terms of a, the width of a human hair uh, at standard precision levels. And then you're going up higher and higher to tighter and tighter tolerances. Um, and the, the, big, the big joke in the bearing industry is the, the skateboard and rollerblade industry, you're brutalizing these bearings that are super, super high precision grade for no reason, really. You're putting them on on me to these uh, associated components that aren't anywhere near as tight of tolerance as this, and so it's kind of pointless to a degree. Um, you do get some benefit, but there's a lot more marketing hype around just saying, oh, well, this ABEC 9, this is super, super high precision. You're going to run so much faster, but as soon as you get any dirt in there, a chunk of dirt probably about half the size of human hair, it's going to just get in there and mess everything up. So it's, it's kind of silly. But you know, it's good for us because we saw a lot more of them. But uh, I think that was most of what I wanted to get to in terms of an actual presentation. Uh, I realized that this was sort of just like a, a crash, um, crash course in what a bearing is without really explaining what I do, but understanding at least some of the terms of, I, I, don't, I don't even know, like I guess just what seeing some pictures might help a little bit, and so we can uh, talk a little bit more about what I do. Uh, there's a number of different types of bearings. My job is really to figure out which type of bearing is best suited for a specific application. So like for an electric motor, for a conveyor system, for a car wheel, uh, let's see what it, what else for cranes. I'm trying to think of ones that I've been working on. Um, or for offshore platforms that need to swivel and rotate. There, there's a need for bearing in anything that moves because most of the motion uh, in this world is carried out by rotation in some form or another, and then translated into linear motion or, uh, yeah, you really have linear motion and rotation. And in your car, you might think, okay, we're moving straight, but you're getting there through a lot of rotating components that are meshing together and working together. And so, we're, we're kind of on a component level in the background of every industry across the world. My main focus, coming from Houston and working out of the Houston office, is to support the oil and gas industry. So, you know, not necessarily just drilling equipment, pumping equipment as well, moving equipment, so cranes and uh, so offshore cranes and buoys that need to swivel and pivot or sometimes even rotate at super high speeds for compressors and things like that. So we're, we're a little bit of everything and what I really enjoy about the company is how diverse we are in what we do. If I get bored of working on motor applications all day for 20 years, that's fine. We 
can do so many other things that go learn about, you know, wind turbines. Go learn about uh, machine tools. Go learn about blenders, for that matter. Figure out, you know, what the requirements are about around around that industry, and work on those types of applications. For the, the team that I'm on right now, like I said, supports the oil and gas industry. So it's a lot of, for the most part, I've been working on a lot of long form, big picture projects. Uh, the one that I'm working on right now is wrapping up in two weeks. And I'll be at our factory in France for the, the delivery, for the final inspections of the bearing and handing off the bearing to the customer to go work in their, uh, get installed into their project. Probably won't be the last I hear about it. I, I'd like to, you know, have some follow-up with them to make sure everything's running smoothly, it's performing the way we expect it, and things like that. But in my role at the company, I'm not drafting up a new design for a completely new bearing every day. That would not make sense from a pure manufacturing and business standpoint. You can't completely reinvent the wheel every time you go out there because the process would be so long and slow and just tedious. So my job is to take a look at the operating conditions, the expected loads, speeds, temperatures, things like that, figure out, okay, based off of the available space and uh, the, the, the other similar applications. What style of bearing would be best suited? What size? Are there any specific variants that I, that I need to look at to, uh, to help them meet all of the requirements? Or is this something that we do need to get the design team involved in and come up with a completely clean sheet new design bearing? That, that's where the real interesting part comes in, in my mind, it is, is when we get into those projects where a standard product won't exactly fit, you know, it might work, but we won't meet all of the requirements they had for it. And so then we need to explore and get into uncharted territory a little bit. But I know from the brief explanation I got about what you guys do, with these uh, projects you're given 45 days to come up with something and build it from scratch. That's amazing. We could never do that with bearings. Uh, we, got, we go through an arduous design process on each one. So everything that's in serial production is, is, a, is a function of um, you know, years and years of, of design analysis and improvements. Unfortunately, a lot of times, bearings get thought of last in the industry. So somebody's designing this cool new robot, this cool new crane, you know, what happened? They get everything up, drawn up correctly, you know, oh, it's, it's going to look really cool, it's going to have all these awesome new features, and then they leave a little box this big for what's going to support the rotation. And so, we're like, well move it at all or like what 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 can we do because you're you're asking for something completely unreasonable. So the hope is with coming to you guys early, if you're going out and designing things, is to really think of bearings and, and, and how you're gonna make this thing move first and then get into all the cool design housing, the cool new arm that's gonna you know, throw the basketball or whatever. You know, we, we want to be involved in the entire process. So if you need something this big, you can say, okay, well then I gotta start with something this big. You know, we're not trying to start here to support something, you know, that that would be up here. And and that's the that's the real goal. So it, I don't I you know, just getting a brief rundown, it, it seems like you guys are using pretty standard product on a smaller side of things. 
to work on the smaller side of things as well as the really large. Um, I, I think we work from, we work mostly in metric, but we do have inch options as well. Um, I want to say five millimeter bore, so I said bore, I mean that inner ring diameter is about five millimeters, all the way up to ones that are, uh, I think for tunnel boring machines and stuff like that, we've gotten up to 13 meters across, so huge <laughs> um, and, and for that style of bearing, that's actually, yeah, exactly. No, that's exactly. more like three. Okay. So yeah. It supports the main rotation wheel of that, of those tunnel boring machines, like for the channel and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. The, the project that I'm actually working on right now, um, that I'm going to France for, is... support, the main swivel support for a crane, it's actually the same style of bearing that uh, we would use in those tunnel boring machines, so the one that would get up to the 16 meters, or 13 meters, I guess, not quite 16. Um, this one is actually, the bore is three and a half, the outer diameter is five meters, so it's a pretty substantial size bearing, and that's why they to make sure everything is going according to plan. With these really large ones, every time it's clean sheet, come up with a design. I didn't draw this. This was uh, our design team in France that, that was working on this. And um, I was supporting them with helping the uh, customer determine, OK, what loads, what kind of lifetime, you know, how, how can we make this design best suited for your needs? Because, you know, it, it, when stuff gets into this size range, increasing the diameter or increasing the section height can make dramatic changes in cost just simply because you have that much more material that you're having to work with. And so it, it's really important to optimize the design appropriately. You know, uh, it, it comes into, like, well, this is designed to support 10,000 pounds, let's say. You don't want to design it to support just 10,000 pounds for, for the design life. Because if something goes wrong, if you, know, you have no wiggle room, and this thing could fail early. So you usually play with safety factors. But at the same token, if, if, if you only need to support 10,000 pounds, why make a design that you need to support 10? Thou or excuse me, ten thousand pounds to you know ten million pounds. You, know, you don't need to go something above and beyond just to make sure it will absolutely work. Um, so it, it, there, there's a lot of back and forth on the design process for bearings like these, and that's what we want. We want a lot of back and forth throughout the design process of bearing selection, whether it's standard products or custom products. And um, yeah, and then there was uh, the other thing in this folder was a video uh, from the modeling software that we use to uh, determine bearing life and things like that. This one is actually of an entire gearbox. So gears and housings and bearings all combined, and uh, this was an animation pulled out of it, showing essentially, you know, when this starts to rotate, uh, the helical gears want to pull it in a certain direction, and then as they're displacing, how how is that affecting the rest of the system? 
And so you, we can do these really advanced dynamic analysis of, uh, of conflict systems. So, I mean, that's a, just a, a little brief overview of, of what I do, what I've been working on. If you guys have any questions or want to discuss anything, let me know. I, I brought these uh, catalogs. Uh, this one is a general assortment, and uh, in the front end, it actually has a lot of really good engineering calculations for bearing life, bearing selection. I know I focus mostly on bearings, we do a lot more than that. So there's information in there too on uh, the proper lubricant to select, which is actually very critical. And uh, we have week-long courses on all of these topics where you're just even still then scratching the surface on what, what you might need to know uh, to, to really go through an informed design process. This other one is a more general handbook, it, it, it goes over mounting and dismounting procedures in order to you know, properly support the bearing so you're not damaging it right as you're putting it in, because we see that quite often. Uh, it also has some other recommendations uh, for lubricant selection, seal selection, and it, it, it gives some of the engineering overview that is provided in that catalog, but it goes over it in a more broad sense. We also have our, our website, which has all of this information, and you can pull up 3D drawings and things like that fairly easily. Um, I'll leave a couple of my cards as well. If there's something you guys can't find or run into questions, you can contact me. And uh, as I was discussing with Al, we actually have a, uh, a technical hotline that you can call up if I'm not available and, and get engineering support for bearing selection or loop selection and things like that. And actually, through that service, you can, uh, we sponsor student competitions as well. So depending on the exact specifics, if bearings or product are in stock in the US, we supply up to a certain amount for uh, school competitions. There's a couple of weird limitations, so if you guys are looking into something like that, let me know and I can help, uh, help you guys get it all straightened out. But other than that, if you guys have any questions or, or anything? Yep? Um, on the PowerPoint, there was a bearing and it was like a crescent, I guess. I was wondering what you would use that one for. So basically, the car bearing, well, I'll probably pull up some presentation material on it. But So this bearing is a roller bearing, much like the self lining ball bearing. It's for handling higher loads and things like that. The carb is taking this principle a step further and combining functions from a number of different bearing styles. So uh, it has the lining properties one of these styles of bearings where it can swivel a little bit. It, for our normal operation, you don't want to completely displace them like this because then you're only running on like three rollers. And so it would be bad. You'd have a lot of other problems as well, and your shaft would be coming through and hitting the outer ring. It, it, it would be really bad. The part bearing uh, combines the aligning. It, actually can displace actually as well so along the axis of the shaft to accommodate thermal expansion and uh, you you need that because in all bearing arrangements you'll have one fixed bearing and then one what we would call floating bearing to accommodate axial expansion uh, thermal expansion of the shaft or 
yeah, I guess it's more based on thermal, thermal growth, but um, you generally would, would accommodate that in the house. You guys want to buy some cookies? <laughs> For a dollar. <laughs> We're in the middle of something, guys. Come on. Guys, we're... I'll just go cry now. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, innovation, the innovative part about the card bearing is that it can handle this internally. Because a lot of times what, what we do to allow it to float axially is you mount it tight onto the shaft and then you have a looser fit in the housing so it can just slide. But the, the problem there is you can stick, slip, and and some bearings don't, some styles of bearings don't really like having side loads on them. So uh, you, you can run into some issues. This, that one would alleviate that to a certain degree because it's handled inside the bearing. Anybody else? Anything? All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, they'll probably have other things that I'll try to answer or get yeah, back yeah, to you yeah. with. Um, okay.